So hello, gentle students, gentle readers of Chinese literature in this, uh, of this uh, book, Dream of the Red Chamber, Hong Lomong. I thought I would begin with uh, an interesting quote uh, that is, in a way, relevant to the message of the novel. That is, the novel, Dream of the Red Chamber, is constantly admonishing us, constantly admonishing the reader to be weary of uh, being lost in our passions, in a way, being lost in one's emotions. Not that emotions are entirely bad, but emotions can, in a sense, attract one toward uh, problematic ends. And also, uh, this is a, a good time to use the same message, I'm going to quote Aristotle in a minute, but use the same message to really um, convey what greatness is, at least in Aristotle's opinion. And I think I agree with Aristotle. Aristotle said that uh, we are what we repeatedly do. Greatness is not then an act, but a habit. So, Essentially, we have to create, to engender in ourselves habits to repeat what we know that we should do despite the vicissitudes of our feelings, our passions, and the like. So um, this is what will cause a great problem in the novel, that is, people getting lost in their ching, in their passion. So I'd like to talk today then about um, a principle again related to yin and yang but a principle in the novel of the novel moving from yang to yin which is not an uncommon trope in in chinese literature especially in novels going from yang to yin and uh, we talked about how zhang xinzhi who wrote his du fa his how to read the novel talks about the novel going from le to uh, lung from hot to cold so I think if you read the novel in, in a very, um, I think, informed way, you will see things happening that you wouldn't otherwise recognize happening had you not known this, this yin and yang principle. And then I want to talk a little bit about Wang Xifeng. And in a way, I want to suggest that Wang Xifeng is a kind of microcosm for the entire uh, macrocosm in terms of plot of the novel itself. And... Um, Let's see if we can maybe look at a few passages uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and I can help you uh, maybe read the novel with a, a little more uh, uh, insights, insight. So uh, one thing that uh, I want to point out, that Wang Xifeng ascends in the novel in the early 40s, in the chapters of the, in the, the series of the, of the 40s, chapter 40 and up, right? So for example, you see Wang Xifeng in chapter 41, she basically delights everyone with her ready wit. Um, she's with Granny Liu in the garden, and she is sharp and savvy, and, <clears throat> and her wit is the cause of a great deal of laughter in the novel. And then in chapter 44, Wang Xifeng, and remember that Wang Xifeng is always wearing red. Uh, remember that Granny, uh, Grandmother Zhao describes her as hot, and she's sometimes called Peppercorn Wang in, in, in Hawks' translation. So, so Wang Xifeng is the, um, the epitome of the element summer, of heat, of fire. So summer is going to be her, her season. So in the chapter, four, in the 40s, we are in the novel, we are in the season of summer. So Wang Xifeng is a powerful figure. And so in 44, she's a, a powerful figure <clears throat> when she discovers Zhao Lian with Bao Er's wife during her birthday celebration. So it's her birthday party. It's, there's a great, it's a very young chapter. It's a very heated chapter. There's a lot happening. And, and she goes to her uh, room and she discovers her husband with uh, his lover, Bao Ar's wife, in bed. And she is so evident in the narrative in these chapters because, precisely, it is, it is the season of summer. But then in chapter 46, uh, Wang Xifeng's character begins to wane. In chapter 46, you start to see as autumn, as fall arrives, Wang Xifeng's chapter lose, or Wang Xifeng's character in that chapter begins to lose its power. So Wang Xifeng as a, as a character uh, e equated with heat, obviously is going to be powerful in the, the, what we call the hot or the yang chapters. The first half of the novel, essentially, 
is is young and then the, the second half of the novel will be yin so <clears throat> she begins to uh, she begins to lose her power in the autumn chapter 46 so by the spring festival rites she has deteriorated in strength by chapter 54 she re-emerges as a major part of the narrative during the spring festival uh, uh, rites and in this case just after uh, winter right um, remember that that she is you know, um, that, that yin can contain yang and yang can contain yin. So characters can have high moments outside of their season, but certainly in, this, in seasons that are uh, antagonistic with their own season, uh, then they would, they would fundamentally be at a, a weak point, right? But she begins to, uh, 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 she begins a precipitous decline in, by the end of chapter 54, right? So by the end of chapter 54, uh, Wang Xifeng is, is, she's very witty with her jokes, right? But, but suddenly she's, later she's going to have a miscarriage and she's going to begin to lose blood from her womb because she's overdoing it. And once Wang Xifeng has the miscarriage, uh, for those of you who are not quite to this part of the novel, um, uh, it's a spoiler alert, but of course in Chinese literature, we don't really believe in spoiler alerts We'll just talk about the ending uh, as we as we wish but but certainly once at the once her season ends and once the first half of the novel the yang part of the novel ends Wang Xifeng will begin a decline and her decline as the novel enters into its yin stage that would be her decline and the family's decline essentially parallel one another um, we see uh, the, this principle of yang turning into yi. Now, um, <clears throat> let me just read uh, 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 volume three, and uh, let's see if I can find it here. And we'll go to page forty-three to forty-six. Forty-three to forty-six. So if you're if you are reading Hawks's translation with me, uh, you can certainly look at, at this passage yourself. It's not a short passage, but it's an important one. Well, maybe I won't read the entire thing. Well, here, here I'll begin on chapter 54, volume 3, page 43. Early on the morning of the 17th, the family paid a formal visit to the Ningguo mansion to attend ceremonial closing of the Hall of Ancestors and the taking down and putting away of the ancestral portraits. Right, so this is the end of the spring festival, the uh, requisite... Uh, uh, rituals dedicated to the ancestors have been completed so they're taking down uh, the portraits of the ancestors later in that day when they were back at Rongguo house they attended a new year uh, reception by aunt Xue. there was no question of another visitation that year a dowager consort who had been the late emperor's favorite concubine had fallen seriously ill and the filial fil feelings of the reigning emperor had prompted him to curtail all seasonal festivities in the palace. So from Yuan Chun that year, there was no, there was not so much as a lantern riddle. There was, however, during the days which followed a succession of parties or receptions given by the senior domestics of the household, to which the family were, of course, invited. Lai Da's on the 18th, Lai Sheng's at the Ningguo mansion on the 19th, Lin Zhi Xiao's on the 20th, Widow Shan's, on the 21st and Wu Xingdeng's on the 22nd. Grandmother Jia attended these, or not, as her fancy took her, sometimes coming at the beginning and staying until the other guests had gone, sometimes only putting in a brief appearance long after her arrival had been despaired of. But she refused absolutely to turn up when friends or relations were visiting or to attend the receptions to which they invited her, leaving Lady Xing, Lady Wang, and Xi Feng to stand in for her on these occasions. Bao Yu too, apart from a single duty visit to his uncle Wang Zetang's house, managed to avoid all social gatherings by saying that his grandmother needed him at home to keep her amused. And then suddenly when all the festivities were over, an event occurred which filled the whole household with dismay. Xi Feng had a miscarriage. And then it's the end of the chapter, so naturally it will say, for further information on this subject, you must turn to the following chapter. 
Well, it's interesting. There is this almost descript, almost diurnal, almost mundane description of the daily activities at, at the close of the of the uh, spring festival. Certain obligations are discussed. For any uh, grandmother Jia's involvement is discussed, and then suddenly Wang Xifeng is announced as having a miscarriage. Let me let me read forward a little bit more. Chapter fifty five. It begins with quite an interesting. Uh, a, a couplet, right? Every chapter in Chinese literature begins with a couplet that gives you a sense of what's to come. So it says, a foolish concubine seeks to humiliate her own daughter, and an ill-natured <clears throat> stewardess tries to outwit her young mistress. As we were saying, the first month festivities of the Rongbo mansion were scarcely over when Shi Feng had a miscarriage, confined for a month to her room by doctor's orders and with two or three physicians in daily attendance on her. She was unable to keep up her usual management of the household's affairs. Ah, so Wang Shifeng suddenly, who, who has been really the, the, um, the, the, um, the center of management of the household, suddenly she is unable to manage household affairs. Well, this is a significant shift in chapter 55 of the entire novel. Yet so confident was she of her powers of recovery that she continued in spite of remonstrances to plan things from her sick room, dispatching patients with messages to Lady Wong whenever she thought of something that needed doing. Lady Wong, for her part, was like a woman who, was, who has lost a lamb. A, Lady Wong, for her part, was like a woman who has lost a limb Never at the best of times an energetic person, she attended to only the most important matters herself and left most of the routine business to Li Wan. Unfortunately, Li Wan, though a model young woman in some respects, was not a good manager and allowed the servants to do more or less as they liked. Lady Wang was obliged to call in Tan Chun as a reinforcement. It would only be for a month, she told them. If they could hold out for a month, Xi Feng would by then be better and would be able to take over once more. But Shi Feng was not as robust as she supposed. Like many young people, she had not been taking proper care of herself and the excessive demands she had for some time, been, some time past had been making her nervous energies and they had seriously weakened a constitution that was already far from strong. The miscarriage was in fact only a symptom of her body's exhaustion. A month later, it was followed by the beginning of a chronic small discharge of blood from the womb. Well, I think I, I can pause there. I think you get the point. I wanted to read that long passage because it, it really is an excellent example of a kind of young, active passage um, suddenly being interrupted by a very yin, bad news. She's miscarried. And then it talks about her energy, but uh, she's not recovering. And this is a significant moment in, in the novel. Well, um, another point <clears throat> should be discussed. I guess that the, the general yin and yang nature of, of, uh, of, of Ming and Qing literature. Right? So let's review again the four characteristics of yin and yang as we have of them in, in Chinese uh, uh, cosmology. So yin and yang are opposites, right? So uh, reality consists of polarities. <clears throat> yin creates yang. So by, by proclaiming something good, you e essentially, according to Chinese cosmology, create something bad. Yin contains yang. So there's nothing that's perfectly yang or perfectly yin. For example, at noon, at the height of the sun, we'll have shadows. So you have a little bit of yin in, in, a, in a, a yang moment. And then yin becomes yang, that is night becomes day, day becomes night, in that, in that way. Um, so Hong Wamang, Dream of the Red Chamber, basically follows the yin and yang structure pretty dutifully, right? And it <clears throat> follows the structure of the novel Jinping Mei, and um, sometimes translated as Golden Lotus. So if you look at the novel Jinping Mei, uh, the novel is 100 chapters, and uh, at chapter 50, the novel Golden Lotus or Jinping Mei shifts, right? Um, an, an odd monk appears and gives Shiman uh, a magical medicine. This is in the novel Jinping Mei, Golden Lotus, right? An odd monk appears in chapter 50, gives Shiman a magical medicine, and he begins his decline. 
So yang becomes yin at chapter 50. Everything begins to uh, decline about here, 50 to 55, in, in Dream of the Red Chamber. So if you look at chapter 49, for example, the garden in, inhabitants, they have a venison party. And they're having a venison party because, you know, venison being a young meat, they're eating a young meat in, in winter to sort of invigorate their, their young chi, their, their young energy. Um, and so again, with, just to reiterate this, with chapter 54 and 55, Wang Shifeng begins her decline, and that is really the magical transition in the novel. So for those of you who are in the, in the 50s, you are noticing uh, uh, the, that the novel is, is beginning its precipitous uh, uh, collapse. The family is, is in decline now, and the novel will continue this way until the very end. And then another thing I want to point out is that one of the problems that that one of the problems that causes this decline is really a disobedience to Confucian ideals. So what happens is the idea of, of the rectification of names, that things must accord with their names, things must match, things must be logical, they must be rational. We must obey the rules, essentially. And if we don't, then things, then chaos ensues. So uh, Confucius taught this notion called Zhengming, or the rectification of names. And um, probably one of the most famous passages uh, in, in, in the, the entire Analects of Confucius, this is the Analects of Confucius, right? Um, the Lun Yu. <clears throat> one of the most famous passages is... Uh, 1211 and, and I've, I've, I've perhaps recited it often perhaps even in, in these these lectures that are being recorded but I want to read uh, briefly uh, this passage about rulership right and it's the Jun Jun Chan Chan Fu Fu Zhe chapter a ruler is a ruler and a minister is a minister and a child is a child and a parent, a parent is a parent a child is a child passage but it has to do with with the rectification of names and, and once I read this and explain it a bit, then we'll talk about how this applies to the novel and the novel's collapse, right? Or the family's collapse within the narrative structure of the novel. It begins uh, this way. Qi Jing Gong Wan Zhang Yu Kong Zhe Zi Dui Yue Er Kong Zhe Dui Yue Jun Jun Chan Chan Fu Fu Zhe Zhe Gong Yue Shan Zai Xin Ru Jun Bu Jun Chan Bu Chan Fu Bu Fu Zhe Bu Zhe Sui You Su so, so Duke Jing of the state of Qi, he asks Confucius about how to govern, right? And Confucius says uh, when a ruler is a ruler and a minister is a minister and a parent is a parent and a child is a child. That's all he says, right? Um, it's a pretty concise response. His retort is very simple. He doesn't even explain it, right? And Gong Yue, the duke, responds Shan Zai, you know, which means wow, with an exclamation point, like that's impressive. Uh, he says, uh, I believe you when you say that when I believe you, uh, that when a ruler is not a ruler and a minister is not a minister and a child is not a child, even though we have food everywhere, we will not be able to eat, right? Um, and the idea is that um, people must exist within their proper place. Duties must match actions. If my duty is to be a professor of Chinese history, then I must be a professor of Chinese history. When I act outside of those boundaries, then I am not fulfilling that duty, and that duty has a, a lacuna. It has an empty place. A, a, something's missing. Um, when a farmer is not farming, then we have farming that isn't being done. Uh, when uh, when a, a, a bus driver is not a bus driver, then there is no one to transport people to their work. So essentially, when things do not match what they're supposed to match, then we start to have chaos. And then in another passage, and this is in 13, uh, number three, um, you have uh, Zilu who's asking a question, and he's asking a question, you know, basically, you know, how do I govern, right? Um, and, and then Confucius' answers, what was the key to governance? It says, Zuye bi ye zhang ming hu. That is, it is, it must be, it is certain that 
names must match. Uh, the rectification of names is the key to governance, that all things can only function properly when they are properly behaved, right? Now, that's a very powerful Confucian statement. Now, what, what do we see then? What we, we see this, that in chapter 49 in the novel, you start to see a collapse of Zhengming, a collapse of the rectification of names. So starting in chapter uh, uh, 49, for example, I guess you could look at volume 2, page 473 to 474, there are so many people in the garden that the formalities of address are abandoned, right? Um, that is, everyone is supposed to refer to each other by the proper, by proper names, but there's just so many people in the garden that they start to abandon these social norms, these social rules. And then if we just look at, um, if we look at volume two, let's see if I can find this, volume two, um, <clears throat> page three, 22, page 322. This is a significant, significant uh, uh, event that, that begins to happen here. Um, Granny, Granny um, Leo is, it says here, uh, um, which of the young ladies does the bed bedroom belong to, right? So Granny Leo ends up in the bedroom of Jia Baoyu, who is a male, right? And Granny Leo asks, which of the young ladies does the bedroom belong to? So his room, Jia Baoyu's room, is feminine, right? And according to the novel, according to classic Confucian tenets, that 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 vagueness of of, of a gender matching uh, represents a kind of lack of the rectification of of, of names, right? Um, and then you see in other sections, Jia Baoyu will be. Uh, confused for being a girl and that also represents a kind of uh, a, a, a kind of a, a breach against the, the rectification of name um, <clears throat> the other issue that starts to happen toward the middle of the novel right so this all happens in the middle of the novel uh, these 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 uh, violations of Zheng Ming according to the Confucian uh, principles and then you see Yang becoming Yin again you know flourishing turning into collapse but what happens then is all the people, the, the young people in the novel, uh, are of marriageable age. So they should be, they should be, uh, in in a way, keeping their distance from one another. Right? Jia Baoyu is there with uh, with this large number of girls, and they're all of marriageable age. And the fact that they're intermixing is a problem of expectations, right? So that. That, that, that sort of that gender expectation, that social expectation that would be in, in, infused into the culture within the novel, within this family, all of these things are, are being in a way violated, right? So what, what can we say about marriage? Just, so let's just leave the, the structure of the no novel for a moment and talk about the expectations for marriage. And then for those of you who are reading the novel, you can ask yourself, how are things happening according to these expectations? Um, so typically, uh, marriage during the Qing Dynasty would be that bri brides were typically uh, around uh, 15 to 18 years of age when they would marry. Um, husbands were anywhere from 17 to 21 by and large. Um, brides could keep their dowry, so thus, you know, the, 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 the dowry that they had, their own personal wealth, they kept that. It was their own that was their own money. So that's why you see that Grandmother Jia in the novel is so uh, incredibly wealthy because her money is her money. It doesn't belong to the rest of the family. Marriages were always arranged. This is crucial. So you have these mayren, these, these um, you know, usually, well not usually, always women who were in charge of making uh, uh, agreements between mitigating or uh, sort of serving as marriage diplomats between the two families, that is, to help arrange for a marriage. So marriages uh, were used to establish family alliances between elite families. Um, they were not about love, right? They were not about Qing passions. So thus, Baoyu and Daiyu's romance was extremely problematic 
is extremely problematic in the novel. In fact, it's improbable, right? You don't just fall in love with someone and get married in the Chinese context. Um, in an elite family, a marriage of a woman could only uh, a woman could only marry a single time, right? Uh, for the most part, for the most part, brides were isolated from their uterine family uh, once they were married. Not entirely, but for the most part, a woman's power was derived almost entirely uh, from producing a male heir, from producing a son, right? So. Uh, but then again, women typically ran the finances. So you see Wang Xifeng being the, the, the sort of financial manager of the household. That was not, not uncommon. Husbands and wives were expected only to see one another after dark. So the fact that Wang Xifeng and her husband, uh, Jia Lian, see one another during the daylight hours is also a kind of, a kind of uh, a violation of Zhengming, of rectification of names. Mothers, mothers-in-laws, and daughters-in-laws uh, typically had power struggles. We don't really see this in the novel, but we do. We do, and we don't. Um, Wang Xifeng certainly. There are moments where Wang Xifeng uh, demonstrates a kind of uh, frustration with her mother-in-law. You have wives and concubines. A, a wife would be in a full marriage. Uh, a wife claims the concubine's children, right? So. Uh, Tan Chun is the daughter, daughter of, of Jia Zheng and Aunt Zhao, but she claims to be Lady Wang's daughter. So if you look at page 53 in volume 3, you see very clearly that Tan Chun doesn't claim her blood mother as her mother. She claims the main wife. Right? Concubines are a kind of mini-marriage. Concubines are considered the quote-unquote younger sisters to the wife and uh, they are bought and thus they can be sold and returned. So um, just by way of a conclusion then, uh, Aroma is promoted to Baoyu's unofficial chamber wife, volume two, page 204. Well, this actually is pushing the limits of the rectification of names. Maids do not become wives, even if they're chamber wives. Right? So people consider this to be an odd arrangement, but nonetheless, the arrangement is made. So the family is starting to break uh, ex Confucian expectations. And that, that beginning of breaking Confucian expectations and then Wang Qifeng's miscarriage marks the, the, I mean, her bleeding of her own blood uh, throughout the second half of the novel equals the, the bleeding of the financial stability of the household after that. Well, um, the weather begins to turn cold. Uh, rectification of names begins to uh, collapse. Wang Shifeng becomes ill from overdoing it. Um, she begins to bleed. Ble blood is an yin substance, so it, literally her blood is yin. yin. Um, and then we we uh, see that we see that because of these violations, the family begins then to. Uh, to, to lose its, its power. And there is some tragedy ahead if you are reading along in the novel. Well, my clock is telling me that it's noon, so apparently uh, it should be time to have lunch. And uh, so I shall end here, but I do wish everyone Juni Shanti Jian Kang. I wish you all uh, very good health. And Bu Zhi Yu He Lai Shi Qie Ting Xia Hui Fen Jie. If you want to know what happens next, uh, please stay tuned for the following post. Gambe.